Hey everybody, so here we are again, another episode of Chalkboard History. With us today is Battle of Franklin Trust interpreter slash historian slash professor Joseph Rickey. So we're not going to eat sausages and we're not going to use hot sauce and talk about old times. Well, we are going to talk about old times, but we're going to talk about old times in the Army of Tennessee. So this is a subject that, oh goodness, it's probably been debated in some circles since... 1862 and then was fought over <laughs> you know for decades after the war and into the 20th century and people still talk about it today and you know there are people who like each of the commanders we're going to talk about army of tennessee leadership and so like every commander it seems who led the army has a little click of fanboys or a uh, club of just outright detractors and haters. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to uh, go through the list and, and, and talk about them. So the, so the first commander of, well, it really wasn't even the Army of Tennessee then, but really functionally what was the Army of Tennessee. Army of the army that um, is launching this blistering attack at Shiloh in April of 1862 was mm -hmm. commanded by none other then Albert Sidney Johnston, one of the perhaps actually more of one of the more unknown generals. You know, there's there's only just a little bit known about him, mm -hmm. and he has a very short Civil War career. Um, but he's killed. He's mortally wounded on the afternoon of the first day, and so we'll get to Commander Number Two in just a bit. But talk about Johnston. What? Why? Why are there people out there who? think he was, you know, really so great, and, and if, it, if it had been Johnston in command, things would have been different. It's funny, though, because Johnston, Johnston has, like you said, a very, very short Civil War career. He's got West Point graduate experiences, Mexican War vet, Black Hawk War vet, he knew Jeff Davis, all those little connections. So he shot a gun a few times. A couple of times. Right. Yeah, once yeah. or twice. He'd led a few troops. Right. And I'm being, you know, obviously a little facetious, but... He'd never done anything like lead a Civil War army. No, and he never really led an army before. He had, I think, he only had command of that cavalry regiment, right. and that's about it. So, why do people think he's so great? What is it? I think he's a lot like the Stonewall Jackson idea: is that he died at the very like epogee of his career, and what, which was what Shiloh. You die on the the most successful day that you've had. Do you and think it's partly, though, it. because Jefferson Davis talked so highly of him and Davis thought he was so fantastic? The, uh, the, the public mourning after his death is pretty impressive, the way that Davis calls it. He's the, if there was never another general like him type of, uh, kind of lauding at him. So I've, I think one of the more interesting things in recent years is some very serious, critical reanalysis of Shiloh, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Really, one of the great lost cause uh, themes of Shiloh is that had Johnston not died, you know, Grant yeah. would have lost at Shiloh, and then you know the dominoes fall in the mm -hmm. path of the Confederacy. But as Cunningham really effectively points out in his book, which of course is published way posthumously, mm -hmm. Johnston actually dies in an effort to get his offensive back on track, and mm -hmm. I think Cunningham really cuts through all the sunken road myth and Duncan field mm -hmm. myth and gets to Johnston did acutely understand that the direction of his offensive wasn't going in the direct. He didn't want it toward the river. Mm -hmm. He was trying to sweep Grant away from the river. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he does the most foolish thing an army commander do can do, which is lead, lead from the front, lead from the front. <laughs> right. They don't teach you that at West Point. Well, not, not on, not on the, you know, the, he's not a line officer. And so, yeah. so he well, does. The thing too is that, and without getting too far into the weeds on Shiloh, it's such a super fascinating battle. It starts off with so much momentum. I mean, the Confederate Army is just slamming Grant men back, all the way back towards the river. But they're going up and downhill. They're going through ravines. They're fighting really hard, so they're getting exhausted. That exhaustion wears on the ranks, wears on Johnston, because effectively he's got to try and keep the army moving. Mm -hmm. And then, naturally, he gets stuck out front, and it's the... The last image that Treoni print with him in the tin cup over his. I wish we had a little tin cup, a little tin cup over his head. Yeah. Oh, we have Sherman. He was there. Yeah. He was there, getting you know, getting caved in early that morning. But yeah. one of the themes that we'll talk about, I think, throughout this is, 
it isn't just Army of Tennessee leadership. Mm -hmm. It's often who the Army of Tennessee was fighting against, and yeah. not just their commanders, but the soldiers who were wearing the yeah. other uniform. So Johnson's dead. You know, killed in this freak injury, shot in the back of the leg, bleeds mm -hmm. to death. You know, before he really understands what was happening. I always have thought the whole tourniquet thing is, you know, perhaps overplayed. I mean, he's mm. hitting the femoral artery. It's going to be yeah. pretty hard to staunch that blood flow unless you got it right away. So who takes command? PGT Beauregard mm -hmm. from your neck of the woods, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Creole. Yes. Um, Beauregard is something of the hero at, at First Manassas. So mm -hmm. he is, of course, part of Johnston's army. Some people don't know that. Beauregard had already been shuttled out because he West. had a wing of the army. Right, he had a wing of the army. They didn't call them corps. Mm -hmm. or they had cute, cute clever names. Cute wings. Names. wings. Of the army. And within the wings. It's a very Confederate things. thing. Don't use standard military <laughs> etiquette. We'll just call them wings. So Beauregard gets uh, gets slammed because, well, the Southern Army loses. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, you know, Beauregard to me is, he's a good strategist. I'm not sure he's mm -hmm. ever really, he's never really a great commander. But he really gets the short end of the stick when it yeah. comes to his, at least the Shiloh part of his mm -hmm. command, because he's only in command of the army for a few months. But what could I, he have really done the second day of Shiloh? Well, Johnston's dead. The Bob, army's disorganized, and then along comes Bob Hargrove Grant and I. We and Bob Hargrove doesn't like to talk. Our guest from last week. You want to get him to choke on his Vienna sausages? Talk about the second day at Shiloh, because right, what's he? What's he going to do? Grant Grant is just tenacious. Mm -hmm. um, Buell has reinforced him, and, mm -hmm. and so I don't think that... And those are good troops, too, and Bo they're fresh. I don't think Beauregard could do a lot. So what happens to Beauregard? He gets sick, and then he writes a letter essentially asking for a furlough, and I think the furlough is the perfect opportunity for Jeff Davis to just say, fine, take your furlough. Go, go away. And so perhaps the most, maybe not hated or disliked commander of the Army, but I think the most controversial comes in next. So let's let's spend a few minutes talking about uh, bushy, eyebrowed, uh, migraine, <laughs> headache uh, prone, uh, of ill temperament, Braxton Bragg. Venomous. I like that description of him. Yeah. Uh, Bragg is such a fascinating guy too because he's one that you say his name and people instantly either hate him or they have zero opinion of him whatsoever because they don't know who he is. He has no lovers. He has no apologists. He has no fan club. Earl Hess try as he might in his new biography. Uh, tried to shed a little bit of light on maybe some of like the mental and emotional stuff. But I'm going to have to read that because I read Grady McWiney's book years ago and of course he got so disgusted with Bragg he he quit and didn't write volume <laughs> the two. The second volume had to be written by somebody. Like else. a grad student or something. <laughs> but why I don't I don't again, I'm I guess I'm a skeptic. I I've mm -hmm. always kind of pushed against the grain of these especially people I'm like, I didn't know Bragg or yeah. I didn't know any of them. But some of these people, you know, especially you know, just because you've read an article in Civil War Times doesn't make you an expert on mm -hmm. much of anything. Or you attended a few Civil War roundtable meetings, and, and there's, there's a lot of articles. And, about um, that. and, and <laughs> listen, I've I've read a lot, but even I don't fully understand. Well, first of all, I don't understand what it's like to be in command of an army and right. you know, be shot at. And I think Bragg is actually one of the best strategists mm -hmm. that the Army of Tennessee ever had. I, I attended a talk years ago where a guy made this case of course my reaction was like ew you know he's talking he's not talking badly about Bragg and I but I went back and looked at what he did mm -hmm. and you know Bragg is pretty solid the problem is he's he's just not prone to anything that goes wrong he just doesn't mm -hmm. react well to it so right. you know whether it's Perryville Murfreesboro and of mm -hmm. course the culmination of it all is Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Yeah. And, well, yeah, and Chickamauga, I think, bleeds right into. Mm -hmm. um, I hit the microphone. That Chattanooga, Chickamauga bleeds right into Chattanooga. But I mean, you you've been in these circles, mm -hmm. especially the sort of Confederama circles. What what is it about Bragg? Why is he? I mean, I, people say that well, he executed some of his soldiers. They deserted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. That's, Robert that's e the penalty for desertion. Robert Lee e did the same thing. Robert Jackson E. Lee did the, did the same, same thing. Right. So yeah. why why is Bragg a big baddie? I think 
I think it's because of the way that he reacted to so many things and the enemies that he made. I mean, when you can get everybody in the army of Tennessee, corps commanders, division commanders, brigade commanders, to hate you, and yet the only person that's still in your corner is the Confederate president... I don't know that he's exactly... Which he is never a, really made any friends. Which is a that. great point. Davis gets... A, I think Lincoln is a far superior commander-in-chief. Mm-hmm. However, Davis tends to be very loyal to um, a number of commanders, including mm-hmm. one we'll talk about shortly. I mean, he sticks with him and isn't quick to you know pull the rug out from under him like, mm-hmm. like Lincoln does. I mean, mm-hmm. Lincoln does it over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So he finds the one, one or two that fit. So yeah. you, so everybody, nobody in the army really likes it. Now the army of Tennessee leadership, down on whether it's corps, division, brigade, it's just like I think Stephen Woodworth or, called or them wings. wings or wings. Perhaps uh, I don't think they used wings after Shiloh. I don't think so. Not after Johnson was yeah. dead, they started calling them corps again. Corps again. <laughs> so, but even though it's kind of a rat's nest, yeah, there is must be something about Bragg that people found just disagreeable. Well, the other thing, too, is that if you can make... What does Hess say? Does Hess get into the fact that he had... Hess says that there could have been some mental... um, Oh, I don't like like that. Like a mental factor that went into it. Like, why does it always have to be something mental? Maybe he had migraines (laughs) and he had hemorrhoids, which is well documented. And, you know, he ate crappy food Mm -hmm. like everybody else for probably a long time. Mm -hmm. It was outside. And I don't know, getting shot at, you know, for over several years would tend to make me disagreeable. Well, so maybe that is a mental thing ultimately, or yeah. was just Bragg one of those people that just was kind of eh. One of the points that he makes, though, is that whenever something goes wrong on the battlefield, Bragg reacts to it in this almost violent and just really, really overreactionary way. What does he say about Murfreesboro? Exactly that. That all the cent- the the attention at the center. Why do you think he keeps throwing everything towards the center? Keeps throwing everything at the round forest. He's trying to break the entire line. But what does he do the next day when January first when nothing's happening? Yeah. Really, what's he doing? He sets back and he's. But the other thing too is that he's not ever calling that council of war together to get his commanders together. He's not showing them what he wants done. Okay, so Hess just points out that he does nothing. Bad communication. He's Which trying is- to organize the army. Meanwhile, Rosecrans is sitting around licking his wounds, thinking, mm-hmm. gosh, he's not doing anything. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should, you know, launch mm-hmm. up a counter-strike. Then comes Thomas and Woods and Crittenden the next day. And then Bragg really essentially, post-Murfreesboro, mm-hmm. um, loses a good bit of control of Middle Tennessee. That's mm-hmm. how... Well, Murf- that's, but that's, again, you talk about if it's the Confederate commander, give Rosecrans a lot of credit for what happens next. The Tullahoma campaign is one of the most brilliantly executed marches and maneuvers in the war. It is. And as a result of that, Murfreesboro falls to U.S. troops. Mm-hmm. Triune, where they create an incredible series of fortifications mm-hmm. created largely by U.S. troops. Franklin mm-hmm. is then garrisoned by U.S. troops. So this mm-hmm. is all happening early 63, which is also now post emancipation. Mm -hmm. So the Confederate commanders, as well as everybody else, is aware that the scope of the war has changed. And eventually, Mm -hmm. U.S. troops on this side of things were at Ripavilla. They push right through here, and the front actually goes all the way south to Columbia. So so then we have the debacle at um, Chickamauga and Chattanooga. So so Bragg wins at Chickamauga Mm -hmm. in, in a... In a very fluky kind of way. A hollow victory, certainly. But it's a victory. Yeah. I mean, they kicked the hell out of the... Yeah. Um, not out of the entire U.S. Army, mm-hmm. but they they ripped part of Rosecrans's army mm-hmm. really to pieces. Mm-hmm. Thomas, of course, in his you know, famous stand on Snodgrass Hill and all that. But So Bragg, Bragg then pursues to Chattanooga. Why does he just... You know, just... Stop! What happens to him? Well, Chattanooga is super fortified too. That's the other thing, right? But if you're gonna, if you're gonna, he's still trying to reorganize the army after Chattanooga. Uh-huh. Listen to what you just said. If that's Grant, flip the roles. Mm-hmm. Wasn't Vicksburg super fortified? Mm-hmm. So this gets into command. If you're gonna get in there, then you better do something, right? Mm-hmm. And this is where I think Bragg 
really does he doesn't he hits a super fortified position. Mm -hmm. But the, and then too, does he have a plan? I think it's just to capture Chattanooga. Right. But the other problem that he's running into. Well, gosh, is, I could figure. Is the out. army command is is all fragmented too. He's got. It's not just commanders. The other problem is the people that are underneath him. Is Leonidas Polk not exactly the most agreeable person in the world? Add into that. Uh, isn't this? Isn't this? D. H. Hill, and then you've got James Longstreet oh, on loan Hill. to you too. Could you imagine sitting in a like a restaurant with D. H. Hill? He, he would, would complain about everything. He would complain about the server. He'd complain about the food. He'd the complain table about why. Yeah, he's he's just ridiculous. But isn't what you're describing? So he has a plan, but it's not really a good one. But also his command structure is not very good. Mm -hmm. Isn't he in charge of the army? He is. So isn't Bragg sometimes just his own worst enemy? Absolutely. And then the, the, the circular, uh, he put out that circular memorandum basically asking, does everybody still like me? Are we still in favor of me being in command of the army? Oh gosh, maybe maybe he does have some deep seated insecurity issues. I I think one of the most absolutely ridiculous moments of that period is when Jefferson Davis comes to visit the army, mm -hmm. and he they have a big you know a big confab there, and which is really must be uncomfortable for Bragg, and one of the people that Davis brought with him mm -hmm. as a potential addition to the team is. John Pemberton. I I don't even I don't I don't even know what to say either. Pemberton must have just felt as uncomfortable as could be. I don't know what mm -hmm. Davis is thinking. Bragg must have thought, oh goodness. I'm being replaced. I'm being replaced by yeah. John Pemberton, or I've been sold down the river by my command. No wonder mm -hmm. Stephen Woodworth in his great book really described it. I think what does he say? A pit of vipers? Den of vipers, Rats, no, yeah. den of vipers something like that. So yeah. Bragg so Bragg ends up um, Chattanooga occurs, which mm -hmm. is just a, which is mm -hmm. at perhaps one of the most crushing defeats, uh, even worse than I think Shiloh. Chattanooga is just a, a debacle. And it argument. comes on the heels of the great victory at Chickamauga, so it basically negates that. The other thing too about Bragg is the enemies that he makes, even in myth, are the people that in Confederama they worship. Nathan Bedford Forrest is the perfect example, apparently. And, and there's been a great deal of research done into that story of uh, uh, if I should ever cross paths with you again, be at the peril of your own life, that story between Forrest and Bragg. It never happened. But if you can make Bragg the bad guy to the good guy, heavy air quotes, like Forrest, that's another reason just to hate Oh, Bragg. that whole Forrest story, you know, about slapping Bragg's jowls or whatever. Yeah. All I ever thought was... Even if it was true, it just shows Forrest to be an insubordinate yeah. um, uh, kind of person that probably wasn't really well suited to the, the tiers of Army Command. Mm -hmm. So Chattanooga happens. It doesn't go well. That's where Todd Carter... Mm -hmm. Todd Carter's captured south of Chattanooga, actually mm -hmm. trying to get across the river. They captured him at a ford, which is uh, technically in North Georgia. And so who comes... In to fix the mess. Joe we'll, we'll, Johnston. Right, Joe Johnson. So William Hardy commands the army just temporarily. Mm -hmm. um, Davis actually considered Hardy for command, but mm -hmm. old reliable said... Yeah, pass. Hard pass. I'll pass on that. <laughs> Which I don't know why. I, t I don't know that... Hardy dies pretty soon after the war. Look so. at, the, look at the, the people he's surrounded with at that point. Would you want to take command of that army? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because you, then you can't complain about it later on like he did. See, I think that there's... Mm -hmm. that Now, I'm going to talk like a Yankee for a minute. I think there's this sort of chivalry kind of nonsense that goes on with some of these guys. Like, Joe, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Joe Johnston. And yeah. then you find out that you really... Because he really does want it. Mm -hmm. I think Hardy does really does want it. He mm -hmm. just seems to... I, I don't know. I, so, so Johnston takes command. So Joe Johnston... Oh boy, he's got a fan club, big old fan. Club. Joe Johnston, um, yeah, that's PO Box CSA. Okay, <laughs> just send your mail there uh, because <laughs> PO Box CSA, Richmond, Virginia, one two three four five. That's where you can send your fan mail. And here's a guy. I was actually trying to think on the way in. Uh, you know, there have been some like head coaches and managers mm -hmm. in baseball and football who've never been any good. Like their record is like three and eighty, mm -hmm. 
And they're just like, oh, you know, if they'd only coached or managed a better team. I was like, really? Joe Johnston never really did anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not successful aside from first bull run. Mm -hmm. He's not successful fighting against George McClellan. Mm -hmm. He is not at all successful fighting in Mississippi against Grant. And then he takes command of the Army of Tennessee. And opposing him is, you know, W.T. Sherman. And talk about guys that not only different ages and different eras, Mm -hmm. just their whole chemical makeup was different. So what happens to Johnston from, you know, let's not talk about he he gives the army new clothes and, you know, feeds them really well, Mm -hmm. which is what a commander's supposed to do. That's his job. Okay, right. You don't get, you don't get good job for doing what you're supposed to do. You get a paycheck or you get a promotion. But when the, when the campaign starts, it's always on the defensive po- and that's his thing too always on the defensive and remain in a defensive posture but and, then and but then you retreat from some of the best defensive lines that he had ever seen so i get so here's this is one thing i want to really go down on a little bit just talk about this for a few minutes most of these commanders at west point had studied either napoleonic techniques mm-hmm. Um, Germanian thing. Thi- okay, a lot of this is offensive. In fact, the mm-hmm. bulk of it is offensive. Mm-hmm. You see the best commanders, mm-hmm. both sides. But let's say Lee and Grant. Yeah. It's offense. Mm-hmm. It is hit the enemy and hit them hard. Mm-hmm. That's what Davis wants, Jeff mm-hmm. Davis. Why does Joseph Johnston not subscribe to the very thing that he had been taught? And there were examples all around him of successes of both his peers mm-hmm. and of the enemy. Why does he do this? I think a little bit of it, and this is you know, speculation, a little bit of it is building the army and getting it to where he wanted it and then suffering a lot like McClellan and oh, not so, wanting to use it. So he's McClellan but then the in other, a gray uniform. But the other part of it is he has a smaller, numerically smaller army than Sherman. He doesn't want to risk the casualties. Either of those is, I mean, I guess a justifiable reason for wanting to be on the defense because you can build earthworks and you can fortify and you can protect yourself. But the other part of it, you're not going to win the war on defense. And that's what Davis understands. So why does he do it? I think he gets locked into the idea. Huh. It's that simple. And then every turn that he makes... Sherman's right there behind him, or, or thinks, right on the side and, of him. And not only does he get locked into the idea, he actually thinks he's right. Yes. Do you think there's a little bit of hubris on the part of Johnston where he just thinks, <laughs> seriously, like he's the smartest guy in the room? I think so. Because he's a full colonel when the war breaks out, right? Mm-hmm. So here's a guy, he's an establishment guy. He's a U.S. Army guy through and through. Mm-hmm. He's risen through the ranks, but so is Lee. And if you look at Lee and Johnston... I think it's diminished. Joe Johnston's fan club is narrowing because mm-hmm. ultimately, I think for a lot of people, they look at him and they're like, eh, what's the big deal? We'll study Lee. We'll study Grant. We'll look at Sherman. Mm-hmm. We'll even look at Forrest. I I think Johnston's aura, his fan club, was started around the time of the centennial. I don't think Joe Johnston ever really was all that spectacular. Because like, just like you, I mean, I've read... Battles and Leaders of the Civil mm-hmm. War. I've God, I've read his memoirs, which are just... It's a slog. Well, and he's mm-hmm. also just blatantly dishonest at times. Yes. Joe Johnston lies with incredible mm-hmm. skill. Um, he lies about casualties. It, the yeah. army that he hands over to the next commander. That, he, God, he, that's just crazy. He lies about Cassville. I mean, he just yeah. straight up lies about it. But I think that there's an ample amount of evidence that actually the anti-Bragg club... Mm-hmm. was built at the same time that the pro Johnston club mm-hmm. were. Now there was some foundation to that from mm-hmm. the 19th century, but it mm-hmm. really is cemented by the guys who are today 70 and 80 years old mm-hmm. who were our age, well maybe not my age at the time of the centennial. Mm-hmm. And they just it was like breathing air. It's, you know, it was it was everything that hurt. Johnston which, good. Johnston Bragg good. Bad. Brag bad. And then Johnston is relieved because of well, course well, he falls back across some of the best ground that God could have given him to defend. I think you stole that line from me. I sure did. 150 miles. Yeah. So he. But so then the best part of it is on July 11th, he writes a letter to Jeff Davis and he says, 
I'm thinking of, that you should get all the prisoners out of Andersonville, which to Davis is, he's going to give up Atlanta. And who does Davis send to Atlanta? Now, you want to talk about chivalry and how the sort of Southern code of honor must work? Bragg shows up. <laughs> Johnston's not stupid. I mean, he knows why. Good God, they're going to replace he, me with him. <laughs> well, I don't know what I, I don't know what Johnston was thinking, but he knew what Bragg's role was at that mm-hmm. time. Military advisor to the executive. So you're Bragg for a minute, yeah. and I'm Joe Johnston. Oh boy. <laughs> he 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 never speaks to him. Yeah. And so Bragg kind of goes around and and, and and doesn't ask any real direct questions like what the heck is going on. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get somebody to say something. And even in that sort of cadre of misfits and whatever, they don't really say anything. And so Bragg goes back to Richmond and poor Jeff Davis. It's one of the few moments I have sympathy for him. Davis is like, what's going on? And Bragg's like, I don't know. Not much of anything, I don't Not guess. Not much of anything. <laughs> and... You know, from the Confederate perspective, taking everything else aside, you know, it must have made Davis want to just rip his hair out. Because he has a commander in Virginia who never pulls these kind of stunts. Mm -hmm. Ever. And never really asks for guidance or needs it. And Bragg comes back and Davis is given information that reinforces what he probably already thought, which Mm -hmm. is Johnson has to go. And here comes J.B. Hood. And on the 17th of July, 1864, and I, I will say this over and over, John Bell Hood was as decorated and as respected uh, as anybody in that army, mm-hmm. and even some elements of the army from the East. I mean, he's as capable. Hood had the, had the resume, mm-hmm. okay? Because Lee's not coming west. Nope. Longstreet's right? already done Long, this deal. He's wounded. Yeah. Okay, Longstreet had just been wounded. Mm-hmm. Jackson's dead. Yep. You've already tried all the other guys we've talked about, mm-hmm. or some like Johnson number one, are mm-hmm. dead. Or you, and Hardee's, and you've worked your way into a position where you can't possibly ask them to come back. Hardee's passed. Yep. You're not going to give it to Dick Taylor. Not only is he your former brother-in-law, he's not a West Point grad. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to give it to N.B. Forrest and Pat Claiborne. I mean, yeah. it's just... Two don't, guys with massive let, Let's just clubs. once and for all say, that's a stupid thought, okay? <laughs> that's just a stupid idea. You're never going to give command. I can see the comment section for Oh, this. goodness. The, the fan clubs will... But you're... There's a reason. Jeff Davis yeah. wouldn't even consider those people mm-hmm. um, to be in command of the army. So Hood gets it. Yep. And, I mean, we talk about Hood every day. And so I don't think we probably need to, as they say, beat that dead horse. But maybe the one question is, aside from what's also a centennial creation and later like 1980s, 1990s, largely Carter House slash Wiley Sword creation. Mm -hmm. Put aside Laudanum. Put aside Sally Preston, his girlfriend. Put aside... He was writing letters to Jeff Davis. Well, yeah, so were three or four other people. So that's that doesn't excuse Hood, but let's not pretend he's the only one Mm -hmm. writing about Johnston. He's just the only one that got promoted. Why, Why is Hood... Bragg is disliked and distrusted mm-hmm. and dismissed. Hood is hated by some people. Mm-hmm. How did John Bell Hood... Somebody needs to hold the bag. He's the commander in charge of the army when it's wrecked in Tennessee. And when you can make that story and you can make him out to be this evil, awful butcher. Because how did they describe Franklin at the Carter House? Yeah. Useless onslaught, murderous fire. Glorified suicide. Well, and, and it's probably true. Hood loses Atlanta. Mm. Well, also, well, he inherited from Johnston a really shattered army, too, outside of Atlanta. That's the thing, is yeah. that the Johnston apologists yeah. will tell you that the army was never in better shape. Johnston, he couldn't get them to do anything. The Johnston apologist, Johnston said that. Johnston yeah. lied about his casualties. Yeah. He, he, he at least... I think he said he had 10,000 casualties, and he probably had close to twenty two to 25,000 because he didn't factor in the desertions. But mm-hmm. there are two things. Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And what happens to Atlanta? Sherman. Uh-uh. Hood uh-uh. burns it. No. What happens to Atlanta? What do you mean what happens to Atlanta? What happens to Atlanta later on? Later on? Later on. Like 70, 80 years later, what happens to Atlanta? Oh. 
See if you can figure it out. 70 years on from the war. Yeah. A little movie. Movie? Little book. Little book. Little book. Which Written becomes, in the dump by Margaret Mitchell, which, which becomes a movie Gone which with the Wind. Which becomes yeah. one of the most epic movies ever made. Yeah. And so once Gone with the Wind reached the public, mm-hmm. not only does Hood become a hated villain, mm-hmm. so does Sherman. Yeah. And and that is something that we we deal with today. And then, of mm-hmm. course, there's Franklin and Nashville. And what happens at Spring Hill or what didn't happen at Spring Hill? So mm-hmm. Hood's out by the um, you know first few weeks of 1865, and, mm-hmm. and Davis has got it. Oh, you know, he's got to try. Well, he tries to stave it off Hood. by getting Richard Taylor in there. Yeah, but Taylor's like, no, I don't want that job. <laughs> and Davis is trying to hold back, like, I think I'm going to be sick. And he has to give it back to Joe Johnston. Can you imagine how he must have felt for like a week after doing that? No, I, I've I've looked at the way that Johnston and actually Hood, in, in one of Hood's worst moments, mm-hmm. he and Johnston are bickering like a mm-hmm. like a couple of children over the tone of the reports that were filed about Atlanta, and I think it's James Seddon. Mm-hmm. Or is it who's Secretary of War then? Is it is, no? It's Breckenridge, isn't it? It's Seddon. Is Seddon still Hood's writing to Seddon? Is Hood right? Anyways, I, wh- whoever it is, if it's Seddon, he finally says, "Listen, you two schmucks, mm-hmm. we don't have time for this. You know, Richmond is about to fall. Mm-hmm. Basically, your 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 Southern manhood has been, you know, challenging what you're going to duel, and it's it's really a sad <laughs> chivalry." Well, just or stupidity, and I and I think that that really shows the sort of decadence that that mm-hmm. existed within some of these men. And Hood gets sucked in to that same kind of nonsense mm-hmm. right up until the end, and then of course the war is over, mm-hmm. and um, so Johnston's dead. Johnston number two is quite alive. Mm-hmm. Beauregard stays out of the fray. By and large, until he writes his own narrative. But he yeah. doesn't really... Well, Beauregard's just not terribly confrontational. I don't think so. I think he's very much of the camp of, it's over, and let's just it's be done It's over, and it. let's be done with it. And then Johnston and Hood engage one more time. It's like Hood can't... Hood's too thin-skinned. And Johnston is too much of... of he's just... He has to be right. And so mm-hmm. he writes his memoirs, which, of course, Hood responds and not always the best of response. And here we are 160 years later. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know exactly where it's going, but what do you think the, the legacy of the Army of Tennessee leadership is just, you know, among the... Uh, what, what is the future of it? How are people going to view, you know, mm-hmm. these men 20 or 30 years from now? Well, I think, I think Larry Daniel hit on that really well in the Concord, Why the Army of Tennessee Failed. When he talks about leadership, he essentially runs it down to egos, which is always a problem. And then the other part of it is who they were facing. They were never never set up for success going up against Grant, Sherman, Thomas, and Rosecrans. And that's probably I I I have it's not what I think. I've I've heard it. Mm-hmm. I've started to hear much more that the biggest problem that the Army of Tennessee faced were the guys on the other side. Yes, there were many command issues. But when you had the trifecta of Grant, Sherman, and Thomas, Grant never loses a battle. Mm-hmm. Sherman doesn't lose many. And mm-hmm. and Thomas is rock solid. Yeah. Because on the other side, Lee is not fighting that sort of A-team. And when Grant goes east, Lee is never the same. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't weaken the West when he leaves either. Because now you've still got... Right. Sherman and Thomas out here. And the other thing is that these commanders had a much bigger field in which to operate and try mm-hmm. and defend than Lee ever did. Mm-hmm. So it may have been doomed, which goes back to the early stage. I want to end with Albert Sidney Johnston. I think Albert Sidney Johnston knew when he got to command of department number two, mm-hmm. this was not going to go well because yeah. there were too many rivers, there was too much land, mm-hmm. and it isn't that they just didn't have enough men. It was just an almost mathematical impossibility. Mm-hmm. 
And to, to this day, I think the Civil War, our American Civil War, was won and lost in the mm-hmm. Western theater. And that these men, um, and we're going to talk about the other side probably in a few weeks, about leadership on, on the federal side, but that this is where the war was won and lost. Shiloh to Franklin. Mm-hmm. You get in that bandwidth, that's not only where one side lost, but it's where the other side won. Mm-hmm. Final thought? That's it. I mean, the, nailed it. But the other thing, too, is a couple of things people can read about. Concord's a great book, Larry Daniel. And then. Larry Daniel's a great the, author. Six Armies in Tennessee, uh, Stephen Woodward's book. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic book, too. I think both right. of those are for sale in the bookstore. So, shop.off.org. All right, good stuff. Thanks for watching, listening. That. <laughs> <laughs> 36? 30 There's probably a minute.